Okay, in today's lecture, we're going to talk about laws versus theory, reaction mechanisms, and catalysts and enzymes. So, as we start most lectures, go over some of the vocabulary that we need to know for this lecture. Okay, kinetics we've talked about for the past few lectures. You can go back and read uh, the textbook or watch the videos and learn something about first order reactions, second order reactions, and rate laws. Kinetics overall tells us, you know, what happens and, and how fast, right? How long does it take reactants to go to products? And the quantitative description of that is known as the rate law. And the rate law, as we've talked about before, looks something like this. Rate equals, it's always rate equals rate constant, times some concentration of reactants raised to some power. So maybe it's A plus B is the reaction. So here's A to the X, B to the Y. And it's about us figuring out what are X and what are Y. What are the orders of the reaction? Okay, that's the vocabulary we've learned thus far. But why exactly this would be the rate law for a reaction and where the orders come from, well, we learn that by doing experiments and then that informs us what is the mechanism. Okay, so we've talked a lot about uh, do experiments to figure out X and Y. And then once you know X and Y, you can theoretically predict the mechanism. And the mechanism is a series of stepwise reactions that show how reactants become products. So overall, while we might write A plus B becomes C plus D, that doesn't necessarily mean A bumps into B and makes C and D at the same time, okay? The mechanism here, if this is the overall reaction, the mechanism could be two separate steps, right? You could have a step where A really just decomposes and it decomposes and falls apart to make C and E. And then maybe in a second step, E, bumps into molecule B to make D, okay? And the first step here will have a rate law. That depends only on reactants, only on A, and maybe it's to the first power, but we have to do an experiment to know for sure. And the second step will have a rate law, and maybe that rate law looks like this. So here we can illustrate that A plus B going to C plus D, right, is the overall reaction, but it's a little bit misleading. So a lot of times when, you know, chemists write something like this, uh, the general public or uh, people that, that don't know a lot about kinetic theory will assume this means A bumps into B, but that's the overall reaction. The mechanism tells us exactly how A and B turn into, in the end, C plus D. And in this case, we're forming one product, but we're forming E here, and E is going to be something called an intermediate, something that's formed in one step and consumed in a later step, right? Doesn't appear in the overall reaction. Nowhere is E up here in the overall reaction, but it's an intermediate, it's formed and then consumed. But when you add up these various steps of the reaction mechanism, you should get the overall reaction. Now, a rate law, okay, can be written for each of these mechanistic steps. And the rate law will point to what is the slowest step. And we'll describe this throughout the lecture, right? If step one is slow and two is fast, right? We could label these K1 and K2, okay? If step one is really, uh, really slow and two is really, really fast, then K2 is much, much greater than K1. And step two is much, much faster than step one. And the length of time it takes for a overall reaction to happen is limited by this first step and the rate law might just be this rate law which points to a real dependence on a falling apart and maybe not much of a dependence on the second step since it's so fast as soon as one happens two is off and running and is done okay so this is the type of information we're trying to understand get at and theorize these mechanistic steps based on the experimentally derived rate of reaction. So that's sort of the overview of what kinetics is and, and what reaction mechanisms are, right? Each of those steps one and two uh, is known as an elementary reaction, okay? So one and two on the previous screen, right? 
These are the elementary steps, elementary reactions, elementary processes. Okay, and you could have a one-step reaction where the overall reaction is just that one mechanistic step. So, you know, you could have A and B colliding to make C plus D. That's the overall reaction. That's the one-step reaction mechanism. That is possible. But a lot of times you'll have multiple steps in the process or multiple elementary steps, I should say, for the overall reaction. Now, the molecularity of each step tells us how many molecules are involved in the step of that mechanism. So for our first mechanistic step we talked about here, A just falling apart to make C plus E, okay, this is called unimolecular. Okay, how many molecules are involved in that step? And we're really talking about the reactants, okay? Uni, so one reactant. The second step in our mechanistic sequence, our second elementary step, was E plus B going to D. Okay, this is a bimolecular step. Because there's two reactants. And these elementary steps here now tell us how many things have to collide. Right? In the overall reaction we were talking about here, A and B don't necessarily have to collide, and in the mechanism they don't. A falls apart, and then this E intermediate created collides with B. Right? But in these elementary steps, we are describing exactly what is happening at the atomic level details that we want to know. So here in the second step, A collides with B. In the first step, A simply falls apart. It's unimolecular, one reactant, decomposing. In the second elementary step, E and B collide together and combine to make D. Now, of course, uh, overall here, you add up these mechanistic steps, there's an E on each side, it drops out, and we have A and B appear in the reactants, and C and D appear in the products. And so, yes, this is our overall reaction. Okay, so just uh, building on our fundamental vocabulary here. The molecularity is how many molecules collide in that step. Is it a unimolecular process? Is it a bimolecular process? What is the molecularity of this step? That describes how many things physically have to bump together uh, to react. And besides uni and bimolecular, you can have termolecular, a step that requires three molecules to simultaneously collide. So, you know, you can imagine another reaction when A, B, and C all have to come together just right to create some product D. And so, again, this is an elementary step, a termolecular step we're talking about, right? If maybe there was some third step of our elementary step, uh, these three things might have to collide together in a certain way to make D, right? These are pretty rare. And you can imagine that because if you just think about, right, some A molecules floating around, some B molecules floating around, and some C molecules floating around in space, maybe A is going this way, right? And B is going this way, right? And this A is going this way, and this C is going this way. They're all chaotically moving about, right? You know, if you play this movie forward in time, you're gonna have a lot of AB collisions or uh, BC collisions or AC collisions, but in order for three things to come together at the same time and in the right orientation, remember from last lecture, orientation matters, right? It matters if I have a, a molecule that is like this and it comes together uh, with a molecule uh, edge on. All right, let me just uh, use a different color here. All right, so there's molecule one in red. Here's molecule two, right? And these two things have to come together, maybe edge on for a reaction to occur, right? If they come together sort of like inside this other molecule, maybe no reaction occurs, right? So orientation matters if the thing has to be maybe in this edge on way for a reaction to occur. So exactly how it's uh, organized in space also matters, right? Orientation is important. So coming back to this term molecular step, you know, imagine the likelihood of A and B coming together and in the right orientation. Okay, I can imagine that. But to also have C at a given moment in time in the correct orientation while A and B are coming together at that same moment in time, 
in a correct orientation is much rarer, okay? And so these are slower, also meaning they don't take place nearly as often than unimolecular or bimolecular steps, okay? So uh, three molecules is termolecular. Whereas bimolecular is two. Uh, unimolecular is one. Okay. Almost all mechanisms only have unimolecular and bimolecular reactions. Termolecular ones do happen, but they're exceedingly rare. So now that we're thinking about, okay, we have all these elementary steps, right? We have uh, step one where A falls apart, okay? To make B plus E. Uh, sorry, C plus E. We have step two. All right, so here's mechanistic step one, elementary step one. Here's mechanistic step two, elementary step two. For the overall reaction, A plus B goes to C plus D. Right? The overall reaction cannot be faster than the slowest reaction in the mechanism. And that's a lot of words, right? But basically what that means is that if I want to understand, you know, starting with a beaker full of A and B, and I combine them, how long does it take for C and D to appear as my products? Well, if this is the mechanism, I have to wait for one to happen and two to happen, okay? So if one takes 10 seconds and step two takes 200 seconds, okay? The overall reaction is not happening any less than 200 seconds, right? That's the minimum of Italian amount of time it would take, it's gonna take 200 plus however long this first step takes, right? So this is important, but because it, it lets us identify what is the rate determining step. And a lot of kinetics, it turns out, has this single step that takes much, much longer than all the other steps. So you could actually imagine there being, you know, three, four, five different mechanistic steps here. Uh, this one takes one second, this one takes three seconds, this one takes 12 seconds, right? And step two takes 200 seconds. So the rate determining step here is step two. That's what we're waiting for in order for our reactants to transition into products. That's the rate determining step right here. Visually, this is shown in the picture at the bottom of the screen here. Reactants, intermediates, products. So this would be mechanistic step one. This would be mechanistic step two. Okay, and you can imagine these spheres as our reactants. A's are turning into uh, B's, right? B's are turning into E's and D or C's and D's. Okay, and just sort of as this like molecular flow uh, diagram suggests, A going to B is not really limited, right? These gas molecules are moving this way. They're they're transitioning from A's to B's, right? But them getting through this tiny area in order to get to products C and D. Right? That takes a lot longer. And so a lot of times this, these pictures are you know, important for letting us visualize you know, not exactly what's happening in terms of collisions, but sort of this like uh, flow that we might be more able to picture, whether it's like liquid flowing through pipes is a common example, or whether it's these spheres that are kinetically you know, bouncing around and trying to get from point A, uh, the starting point to the end point, they have to go through this, which doesn't really limit them, and they have to go through this channel, which really does limit them. So that's uh, what we're getting at here with the rate determining step. It's that step in the process that is really controlling the overall transfer from our reactants A and B to our products C and D. Now, a mechanism is not something we just inherently know, okay? We measure a rate law doing clever experiments, we've talked about this before, and we suggest a mechanism. A mechanism is a theory, right? The rate law is quantitatively what is happening. But a mechanism is that atomic level detail ultimately we're after in order to design a new drug or design a, a catalyst, right? We wanna know how do the atoms actually move around in real time? 
because doing an experiment that captures molecular motion without affecting the reaction itself is pretty much impossible. So we do uh, experiments to learn a rate law, and then a rate law suggests how the atoms are moving around because it's hard to, you know, take a, a movie right, on our iPhone of atoms moving around in real time. So uh, we quantify the rate law. That tells us the rate determining step. And then we use that to suggest a mechanism, right? So just outlining the process here. One, do experiment. Two, get data plot it different ways. Three, obtain the rate law from that data. Four, suggest a theoretical mechanism. Okay, so it's just a suggestion. It's not definitive. You can't prove it. You're just suggesting it. Okay, there could be better experiments that come along and disprove it, but this is how we do kinetics. And this is ultimately the mechanism what we want to figure out. And so the way we do that is after getting the rate law, um, that tells us what the molecularity is for this rate determining step, okay? So if we get a rate law from our overall reaction that suggests rate is K A B, this tells us in a single elementary step, A and B are combining. If we get a rate law that looks like this for an overall reaction where we're putting A and B together, well, that means the slowest step is A falling apart, right? If it's just a rate law that looks like this, that says the slowest step is B just falling apart. And so we have to deduce one of the elementary steps from our rate law and then fill in all the other mechanistic steps in order to get them to add up to our overall reaction. Okay, so the stoichiometry of the overall reaction must be you know, brought out when we add up all the steps, and we'll see an example of this that'll make it clear. Each step, of course, must balance, like any equation. Intermediates have to be used up. Any catalyst that is used uh, must be regenerated. Okay, so let's see this in action because it's a little bit harder to just read the words and understand what the real uh, mechanism is here. So let's do this practice problem. You can feel free to pause the video here if you want and try it yourself. Otherwise, I'm gonna proceed and solve it. Here, it's been proposed that the conversion of ozone into O2 proceeds by a two-step mechanism. So in this practice problem, we're just really gonna identify uh, some of the vocabulary, and then we're gonna see in a, a future example uh, reaction mechanisms and how to guess what they are. So here, we're proposing a two-step mechanism for the conversion of ozone. In the first step, this is an elementary step. This is an elementary step. The first step is a unimolecular step because it's one thing falling apart, one molecule, just ozone falling apart. The second step is bimolecular because there's two things that have to collide and ozone must collide with an atomic oxygen. So that's bimolecular. The overall equation is obtained by adding up these things. So here I have an ozone and another ozone. So I have two ozones. And I also have an oxygen, but I have an oxygen on this side. So I don't write those because they cancel out. So two ozones, arrow, and I have two plus one, three oxygens. Okay, so the overall reaction here, that's what we're answering here in part B. What comes before part B? Part A. Uh, part A says the molecularity is unimolecular and bimolecular. Part B says the equation overall is two ozones making three oxygens. Okay, identify any intermediates. An oxygen atom is an intermediate. That's something that doesn't appear here in the overall reaction but happens in the mechanism. And that's, you know, one of the things about kinetics is you can look at an overall reaction, but you're not really understanding that ozone has to collide with an atomic oxygen. Okay, that ozone has to decompose to create that oxygen in a previous step. So oxygen atoms is an intermediate. Assuming the first step is the rate determining step, rate the rate law. And this is an important exercise, okay? Because it illustrates 
that the rate determining step tells us the rate law. When really in actuality, the rate law tells us the rate determining step. Here we're doing it sort of reverse. Uh, the rate law here would look like this, just ozone to the first power because there's one of these ozones. So if the first step is rate determining, that's the slowest step, then the rate law is just rate equals K ozone to the first power. If the second step was rate determining, then the rate law would be ozone times oxygen atoms. But the first step is rate determining, and that's what we wind up with. Okay. Now, let's do things a little bit backwards here from the previous example, although this is uh, actually more representative of what you might do as a kinetic scientist, right, or chemist, right? You might know the overall equation. You know the overall equation because what are you doing to study this with kinetics in the first place? You're pouring into a beaker or in the gas phase, you're pouring two reactants together, NO2 and CO and you're waiting some time and watching them turn into NO and CO2. So you know what your reactants are at the start. You know what your products are at the end. How exactly do, does that happen? Does an NO2 collide with a CO? Well, you run the experiments like we've talked about in previous lectures. You get the data, you discover the rate law, and the rate law looks like this. So no, this does not suggest in a rate law that NO2 and CO collide together because the rate law tells you, right, what is happening in the rate determining step. How many, here two, of what molecules, here NO2, are colliding. So this tells me that an NO2 is colliding with itself. There's two NO2s involved as reactants, okay? Which I could write like this, or I could write NO2 colliding with another NO2. Okay, so the rate law here, if it's the uh, rate determining step, right? If, sorry, if the first step is the rate determining step, then the first step is NO2 colliding with NO2. Okay, so that's what I write as my first initial step. Now, how on earth am I going to write the rest of the steps? This is the first elementary step. There could be three, four, five other elementary steps, but we're going to start with what we know from the rate law. And so what we're going to do next to figure out what the mechanism is, is realize that, well, when these two things come together, maybe they make one of these products. That seems reasonable. Can they make CO2? No, because there's no carbon over here in the reactants, right? But maybe in this first step, they make one of the products, NO. And so if they're making NO, well, there's still another nitrogen and there's still three other oxygens. So maybe the other product is NO3. Okay, so this is us, each of these mechanisms is sort of like a puzzle that we're theorizing to understand what has to collide in real time to make the products, which really isn't represented here in the overall reactants. This suggests NO2 and CO collide, but kinetics tells us no, 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 NO2 collides with itself, and that's the slow mechanistic step. Okay, so if NO2 plus NO2 have to collide, maybe they make one of the products, product one here, NO, and due to stoichiometry, I realized that, well, if one N and one oxygen is used, there's still one oxygen, two oxygens, and a nitrogen, so NO3 is the other product. So that's what I write here. But NO3 does not appear in the overall reaction. NO3 was not one of the things that I combined in a beaker and studied. Okay, This tells me that NO3 is an intermediate, right? It must disappear in a subsequent step. So why don't I start that second step with that intermediate? And why don't I combine it with the other reactant? Okay, so here was one of my reactants. Here's the other one of my reactants. Okay, what I'm trying to make here is a second step that when added to the first, a bunch of stuff cancels out and gives me the overall reaction I'm after. So let's use up the intermediate. That goes away. Let's combine it with CO, my other reactant. Let's generate NO2 because we have two of them and need to get rid of one. And let's make the other product. And just count up the oxygens in each step. Four oxygens, one N, one C. Four oxygens, one N, one C. Four oxygens, 
two ends, four oxygens, two ends. So within each mechanistic step, one and two, the stoichiometry is right. And adding them all up, one and two together, a intermediate NO3 drops out. One of the NO2s drop out. And I have my overall reaction here that I was asked after. NO2 plus CO generates NO plus CO2. Okay, so this is summarizing what we did there. Since the first step is the slowest step, it gave the rate law. We added up the individual steps to get the overall stoichiometry. Each step balances with itself, right? The same number of nitrogen and oxygens on the left and right of each elementary step. So it's a plausible mechanism. But here, and I'm gonna underline this point, you cannot prove an exact mechanism, right? This is the best we do in kinetics, okay? The best we do in kinetics is looking at the data from our experiment and generating a plausible mechanism, right? And this plausible mechanism we're talking about here tells us that two nitrogen dioxides come together and in a subsequent step, the nitrogen trioxide that we've made is eliminated by combining with carbon monoxide. And so, you know, if we want to encourage this kind of reaction, right? We don't encourage collisions between these two things, as you might expect from the overall reaction. We're not gonna try to collide NO2 and CO. What we're going to try to do to encourage this reaction is speed up this slow step, this slow step that the rate law tells us. So figure out, design a catalyst that speeds up the collision of NO2s, because that being the slow step, giving the rate law, is what needs to be our target to encourage this behavior, if we wanna encourage it, right? If we wanna discourage it, we wanna block uh, the fast step or slow down the slow step. Okay, so this is the molecular level detail that kinetics gets us, uh, gives us that lets us design perhaps a new drug or a new catalyst um, that we're after. Okay, so catalysts, which we have sort of uh, alluded to here, increase the rate of reaction by decreasing the activation energy of the reaction, right? They change the mechanism by which the process occurs. So remember these elementary steps here that we've been talking about, you know, step one and step two that we're uh, combining together to make the overall reaction. One of those, you know, is going to be slow. Maybe it's the first step that's slow and the second step is fast. So this is the step we want to speed up to encourage this chemical reaction. Well, a lot of times we'll use a catalyst. And what a catalyst will do will change this slow step to something else. All right, so a catalyst will change this. to something else that is faster, okay? And actually how it does that is it drops the activation energy, right? So we've talked a lot about in previous lectures, I guess this, this right here is the activation energy now of the catalyt catalytic step, EA, right? Probably makes sense for me to draw this in red. where before the activation energy, and actually that's drawn wrong, that was the reverse reaction. Here it is in red for the forward reaction. So here with this reaction of say X turning into Y, usually I have to get over this activation energy, this huge hill here, but a catalyst will you know, uh, give them atoms and molecules a different way to react that doesn't require this much energy, but only requires this much energy. And in the previous lecture, we talked about the relationship between activation energy, Ea. It's an exponential relationship between the activation energy and the rate constant, which is part of the rate law. So to speed up, to get a higher rate constant, to speed up a reaction, elementary step one, you are lowering the activation energy, and here's a negative here, and so the lower that gets, the higher the rate constant is, the faster the reaction is. And so that's the job of the catalyst, is give the molecules uh, a different way to uh, react together that avoids this high activation energy and gives them an alternative path that is a lower activation energy, thereby changing the mechanism but speeding up the overall reaction. Let's take a kind of a, a pause here and try a practice problem. 
In the past, we've talked about intermediates and transition states for curves like this. Do we recall how to label intermediates and transition states on potential energy surfaces or reaction paths, as I call it here, for a reaction like this? So feel free to pause the video here and try it yourself. Otherwise, I'm going to go on and solve it. So in these diagrams, this is the reactant over here, X. That's my reactant. The thing on the right is the product, Y. That's the product, okay? The top of this curve is the transition state, right? The transition state occurs at a maximum of energy, right? And the activation energy is telling us how much energy do I have to supply to this reaction Okay, to transform X into Y, to get from reactants to products. That amount of energy corresponds to the height of the transition state, which makes sense because the transition state transitions reactants to products. Now, some other reaction paths might have multiple activation energies and multiple transition states, right? Here's one with two transition states, poorly drawn, and one intermediate, which combines the two transition states, okay? So step one, going from reactants to intermediates would be my first elementary step. Step two would be going from intermediates to products, okay? So these are the individual mechanistic steps that pass through a transition state that generate an intermediate, but then that intermediate gets used up. And so overall reactants going to products or X going to Y, right? These transition states and these elementary steps is what we're trying to figure out. On this curve, there is only a single step, X to Y, no intermediates involved, so there is only one transition state and no intermediates here. The last sort of vocabulary we're gonna to touch on here is enzymes, okay? Enzymes are just biological catalysts, right? So enzymes are the things in our body that uh, nature has sort of evolved to speed up certain reactions or block other reactions, right? To encourage certain atoms and molecules coming together to make products uh, much quicker than otherwise would be possible. Okay, so that's all enzymes are. They're biological catalysts, um, but they're special molecules that have a special uh, shape and a region uh, where the reactants attach. Okay, so if A plus B is the kind of thing that we're trying to speed up to make uh, D, and this is very, very slow, well, a catalyst is, you know, not going to have to wait for A and B to just bump together, right? Maybe they're floating around and it takes a while for A to find B, right? And collide with it in the right orientation. Remember, orientation is important. So instead, an enzyme uh, might be able to attract A, right? Or might be able to orient A in the right direction so that when B approaches, it's already sort of primed for the reaction. And that's most of the time what enzymes do is use an active site, right, where the reactants attach with a given orientation to encourage that reaction, okay? In biology, the reactants here are not called reactants. They're usually called substrates, okay? And a lot of times, instead of, uh, writing the catalyst in the reactants or products, you'll just see it written above the arrow. So you might see catalyst here, or you might see the actual catalyst specified above the arrow, like iron is the catalyst written above it, Fe, or you might see the name of a enzyme uh, written up here to tell you that is the catalyst that is bringing A and B together much quicker than otherwise they would to create the product that you want. Okay, so it's just a little bit of, of subtle change of vocabulary when you're talking about biochemistry. Enzymes are catalysts. Reactants are substrates. Active sites are the way they bring things together. And the most common type of uh, active site sort of model we think about in biochemistry is a lock and key model, right? It, it's a very specific site that's evolved over time by nature in this molecule, this enzyme, to fit only this particular substrate into it. Right? So once A finds this enzyme, this enzyme does something to encourage the breaking apart into B plus C. 
And so the overall reaction here is from substrate A, there's an enzyme here E, promoting the decomposition to B and C. You could also imagine the reverse playing out, right? A similar enzyme or the same enzyme could actually encourage the reverse reaction where B and C, right? Flying around in space, it might not be that B and C collide by themselves in the right orientation, but B is sort of attracted to the enzyme and fits here. C is attracted to the enzyme and fits here. And now once they're in this configuration and lined up prop properly, then they form these chemical bonds here that bind them together and then release them overall as A, right? In that example, B and C would be the substrates, but it's really just a reverse reaction of the first one we showed, okay? One of the points here is that an enzyme is specific. So exactly every type of reaction you wanna encourage in your body and other biological systems has an exact type of enzyme, right? And this is just a specialized protein, this enzyme is, that serves as a catalyst uh, for these substrates to turn into products. So with that, we have concluded uh, lectures on kinetics, where we've uh, sort of branched from elementary kinetics and first order, second order, zeroth order kinetics, how we do the experiments, how we get the data into uh, mechanistic theory in this lecture, where we talked about unit molecular and biomolecular steps, how rate laws uh, lead to theoretical uh, mechanisms, and how we really need those mechanisms to do something beneficial with this chemical knowledge, knowing how A and B move around and combine, right? We might be able to encourage or block that uh, depending on what application we're looking for uh, to solve a particular chemical problem. We also talked about catalysts and enzymes here at the end, but that sort of concludes our discussion of kinetics. And that'll do it for this lecture. See you next time.